Wonder if I was to ask you, what makes a great leader? What would you say? If you're anything like me, perhaps you think about someone who's vocal, someone with a dynamic personality, strategic in their thinking, well-liked, very good at efficiently carrying out tasks. Or perhaps your mind is drawn to a particular person whose leadership you've been under before, maybe a school hockey captain or a rugby captain or a particular headmaster that you had. Well, in Titus chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, Paul shares with us what a good leader in the church looks like. And you might be surprised to discover the things that he places as priority. You might remember in yesterday's devotion, Emily showed us from verse 5 the two reasons why Titus left in Crete. Firstly, he had to bring order to the churches and the island. But secondly, he was called to appoint elders in every town there. So it's now after Paul telling Titus to appoint elders that he now shows Titus what type of people these elders should be. What's perhaps most surprising in Paul's description of what elders are to be like is that none of my preconceived ideas of what a good leader should be like appear. Nor does Paul say that these men ought to have dynamic personalities or a PhD in theology. Rather, Paul is more keen to establish the importance of godly character in Christian leadership. For Paul, it's character first and then competence second. In this list of characteristics given to us, you could really break them down into three different areas where Paul says Christian leaders or elders need to be of godly character. Firstly, in their home. Secondly, in their heart. And then thirdly, in their head. Firstly, elders ought to be of godly character in their home. Look at verse 6 with me. He says, Elders ought to be above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Paul says elders ought, to be, elders ought to be firstly above reproach, in other words, above board in their actions, so that no deliberate pattern of seriously sinful behavior can be wavered against them. Secondly, there would be the husband of one wife. He shouldn't be an adulterer or someone who gets around with multiple women. Whether he's single or married, it more literally reads, he ought to be a one-woman man. That final clause in verse 6 about an elder's children is a little bit more difficult. For a fuller explanation, I would really encourage you to read the extended written devotion on our website, which you can find by clicking the link in the description below. However, Paul's not saying that all elders' children must be Christians. Rather, it's a more general principle that faith must be modeled in an elder's home and discipline exercise where necessary to avoid a wild, sinful culture in his family under his watch. So firstly, elders uh, must be godly in their home. Secondly, they're to have godly character in their hearts. Look at verse 7 and 8. Paul says this, For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. It becomes very evident here that Paul's chief desire for an elder isn't someone with skilled hands, but someone with a surrendered heart one that seeks to obey Christ in every aspect of life. Because it doesn't matter how skill, skillful an individual may be, if they've got the wrong motivation, those skills can be used for very destructive purposes. So an elder is to be godly in their house, in their heart, and thirdly, also in their head. Look at verse 9. It says, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also able to rebuke those who contradict it. Elders are to be people who care about faithful doctrine. They have responsibility to ensure that the Word of God and the Gospel of God is faithfully taught and not distorted among God's people. Why? Well, as Paul said to Timothy, false teaching is like gangrene or cancer. It erodes and destroys everything it gets its hand on. It's important as we read these qualifications for eldership that we note that elders are not called to be perfect people. Jesus is the only perfect person ever to have lived. Elders are sinful people just like you and me. However, as this passage does make clear, elders are to be those who lead the way in pursuing Christ-like character among God's people. It's a high calling, it's a difficult calling, and unfortunately, quite often, it's a very discouraging and lonely calling. This week, how can you be an encouragement to your elders? Let me give you three really brief suggestions. Firstly, submit to them. God appointed elders for the spiritual oversight of the church. And the sinful human side of us tends to resist such a submission. But God is the one who ordained this position. So firstly, submit to your elders. But secondly, pray for your elders. Elders like us are in a spiritual battle. Satan knows he can do a lot of damage by getting his hands on an elder. They need your prayers. 
So submit to your elders, pray for elders, and thirdly, walk with your elders. They are your brothers in Christ. They're susceptible to all the temptations and discouragements that you and I face every single day. Encourage them. Thank them for what they do. Send them a text. Write them a note. Walk with them on your collective journey of following Jesus. So how can you encourage your elders this week? Submit to them. Pray for them. Walk.